Janet, this is Ken and Paul calling from Canada from Let's Rock. I'd like to start by thanking you for doing this interview. Of course, you're very welcome. Um, I think it's hilarious that I'm getting interviewed by any any organization called Let's Rock. Yes, <laughs> we're actually branching out. Our next one is a Christmas jazz album. <laughs> so uh, yeah, call me for that one. Call me for that one. For sure. We'll we'll do that. So anyway, we we recently conducted an interview with Brian Beller uh, while he was on his yeah. Aristocrats tour and uh, yeah. also did a CD review for uh, Scenes from the Flood. And yeah. that album to me is an absolute masterpiece. You know, I've, oh, I've, 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 well, I've, I found to listen to a largely instrumental album for the first time and as soon as it was over, a double CD and to want to play it again. That meant that there was something pretty special happening there. And you know what? It's so rare to have that experience. I, I you know, I, I agree because I don't know that I've had that experience very often, like since I was a kid. And you know, it's spectacular. I agree. It is. And seeing him on the Aristocrats tour was uh, was quite good. Hey. So, and I'm very pleased to be speaking to you as someone who has the distinction of being the only other songwriter on a Masterpiece album. <laughs> and also, uh, you play guitar on The Flood, which uh, yeah. is part is in part three of Scenes from the Flood, and is also the song that Brian Beller himself said is as close to a title track as, as happens on that. So I was wondering, yep. how, how did this collaboration come about? Well, Brian and I have known each other for a long, long time. Um, okay. We met at a Mike Keneally gig. Okay. Because I've known Mike for a long time. And so they, I think it was like a Fear for Dolphins tour. It was, actually, it wasn't Fear for Dolphins. It was, Mike was through town with, I don't know, I don't remember if it was a trio or a quartet. And Brian was in the band. And um, Mike asked me if I wanted to open for him, and I said, I'd like to open for him if I could play with him as part of my mm. opening, you know? Okay. So that was really the first time Brian heard me play, was I opened for Mike, I think I played some solo stuff, and then Mike and I improvised together. And then uh, and, and Brian and I shot school for the rest of the evening after his set, after their set, and we just became friends and stayed in touch. Um, I think it probably got when an album was, you know, the album that I had out at that time, and okay. we just started liking each other's work and trying to find reasons to be in the same place at the same time and play together. Um, you know, even though we're, we're not playing anything like the same kind of music, you know, right. but we like we like each other's work a lot, and so we just maintained this friendship for a long time, and then um, and I always, you know, there's that list of there's that list of the people that you always send a new album to, you know, the people okay. that you like and love and admire and respect. And he's, of course, he and Mike and lots of other people been on that list. So in my last couple albums, every time I make an album, I'd send it to him. And um, this is my last album, this is close, uh, I think really, I think it, it sort of um, impressed Brian in certain kinds of ways that, uh, that really went through more deeply than any any of my other work, and I think Brian actually knows that album as well as uh, myself or my producer, my engineer on that work. I mean, I think he's really actually studied the album, and we talked about it a lot. Of course, I told him everything I did and how I did all the stuff I did. I showed him all the secrets and swore him to secrecy. <laughs> um, you know, I just. I just told him about about how the process was with that. I think he he liked how the album sounded, and I think he was really intrigued by the content of that album. So Is then, it? when I, yeah, sorry, I think when he so he was sending me rough mixes. I you know I get to I get some sneak previews of how scenes from the flood was coming along, and then um, you know he had so much of that whole album mapped out in his head for so long. He's been talking about it for years, and. Yes. Then when that particular piece came out, 
came up and he sent it to me. I lived with it for quite a while and felt like I could hear some guitar parts in there. And okay. I don't think I actually played anything for him in advance until we actually until we went into the studio and I sat down and played for him what I was what I was hearing. Now I'm yeah. going to go back just a couple years. Uh, you earned a bachelor of music degree from the University of Massachusetts and. Uh, <laughs> I I can definitely relate. I also have a bachelor of music degree on classical guitar. And I know, yeah, from uh, Carleton University in Ottawa. Oh, yeah, great. Congratulations. (laughs) Thanks, and you too. I think I actually actually wanted a degree in classical guitar, but I was at UMass, and they didn't give a degree in classical guitar. It was, you know, they gave degrees, performance degrees, and so many other instruments, but they didn't give one in classical guitar, so... um, I was studying with a teacher uh, who said, well, get the next closest thing, which for me was a degree in musicology, and he said, just okay. satisfy all the requirements for a classical guitar degree, you'll know you did it. Because I'm thinking that the university environment for music really emphasizes the standard repertoire of you know, everything from the re- uh, Renaissance, Baroque, Classical, Spanish schools of music. And I know when, when I was studying that modern music was there, but really not as widespread. And I was wondering, did you gravitate towards some of the modern uh, classical guitar music, like uh, Leo Brower, Nikita Koshkin, or anything like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was the trajectory that I was on. I was okay. playing a lot of Brower and Koshkin. It's, uh, it's perfect that you name both those both of those uh, composers, and um, and that was really that was really sort of where my classical guitar interest was taking me. And then a very good friend took me one night to hear um, a concert by the band Thinking Plague. Okay. And my head kind of blew up. Oh, that's great! <laughs> like, I mean, I've been loving rock. And, I've been loving rock music my whole life. I played in punk bands, and you know, mm. and I and I and I've of course just. You know, I grew up on rock and roll. It's the soundtrack yes. of my of my upbringing. And then when I heard Thinking Plague, I heard the place where modern classical music and mo- and rock music just collided in the most spectacular confluence. It just sort of like it flipped all the switches in my brain. No, that's that's great. I, I thought about Nikita Koshkin. Uh, I think it was in The Prince's Toys that uh, he had a technique where he would cross the uh, the low A and E strings so that when he hit them... Effect, yeah. Yes, exactly. And yeah. Uh, yeah. when I was listening to some of your music, I was hearing that kind of effect at times, also you know, obviously on the higher strings. So, oh, man, I know exactly what you're talking about. That movement is the doll with the blinking eyes, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, um, from the Prince's Toys, I... Um, that was one of my first sort of stabs or attempts at, a, at uh, extended technique. I didn't really even know what extended techniques were. When I started when I started exploring putting objects on the strings of my guitar, I also didn't know what extended techniques were. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd heard Fred Frith play a concert um, a couple years before then where he was, like, he was hitting his guitar with hammers and there were some chains involved and uh, little metal bowls and stuff like that, and and again, what I, I wasn't I wasn't really drawn to that. I was really drawn to the more melodic um, sounds, not typically associated with the guitar, and trying to find a way to incorporate those into composition. Okay, so that definitely was the start of leading to your experimentation. Well, partly yes, and the other part of it was that uh, someone I love and care about very, very much one night, this is many years ago in the, in the early, in the mid-90s, early, early 90s, mid-90s, uh, suggested something to me, just, he just mentioned a thing, just this concept, this idea, doesn't anybody ever, whatever, and then he left to go to a rehearsal, and I was sitting there with a bunch of objects, I was working on some kind of art project or something, and my guitar was out, and it was sort of like one of those peanut butter and chocolate moments where Mm -hmm. suddenly these sort of disparate things came together and I started putting objects on the strings of my guitar to see how they sounded and by the time many hours had passed 
and he came back, I had I had figured out this one sound that made that when I played it, it made this person I cared about so much it made him throw back his head and laugh. That's... And it was because the sound was so so not like a guitar sound, and there it was happening on a guitar. And I realized that there was this pure joy in in making in making these sounds and figuring out what to do with them that I had been really really missing at that point in playing classical guitar and playing other people's music. And so, yeah, my brain was a little bit prepared for hearing other sounds. It was really kind of this combination of wanting to impress someone okay. and um, and just feeling like a kid again and exploring like, without any kind of other concern. Now, talking about being prepared is perfect uh, segue. His what you do, I guess, is called the prepared guitar. Apparently, yeah. And uh, yeah. that it's a perfect term for it. That you, uh, it's it's great to watch the videos that I, I have been watching over the the, uh, the last little while. When you okay. you talk about what you're about to do and demonstrate the sounds, and <laughs> when you start your music, it's just the amount of color and even texture that you're adding to your music is quite uh, quite amazing and i found it really the music really draws you in you know you're you're more absorbing the sound at times than you are just purely listening to it oh, thank you for saying that and thank you especially for listening so articulately and with such an open mind to to that uh that aspect of my playing it's, you know it's not like it's such a different um Discipline is better than playing classical guitar was, really than playing any kind of other guitar has been, because this is, I'm so much more challenged by how, how sounds sound, how they travel, how they blend with other sounds, than okay. I am by what key am I playing in, what, what chords am I playing, how are all the notes falling together and how am I playing as many notes as possible? I mean, it's just a, it's like a it's a completely different way of looking at at and and considering what happens between me and the guitar. You no. know, like 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 if I if you if if I if I prepared my guitar in a certain way and handed it off to somebody who is more of a sort of shredder, you know, it wouldn't sound right at all. This is you know, it's but I don't know that those. I mean, I don't know if you could ever call it I do shredding or anything, you know, because mm. it's just not really that. It's a right. different a different aspect of guitar playing. It is. Now, can you talk a little bit about the development of your prepared guitar and uh, some of the tools that you do use? I've seen these, again, on your, on your uh, YouTube videos, but mm -hmm. uh, for people um, hearing this, this interview, I'd like to have them get an idea before they go looking about what they're going to hear. Ah, sure. Um, well, one of the things that I use is a thing that most of us have in our pockets kind of all the time, and it's a really it's small and different different sized versions of that split ring that you put your house keys on, and yeah. your car keys, you yeah. know, that, that ring? That's exactly. That sort of universal, we all slide our keys onto these rings, you know? And um, it was actually... Uh, Someone, uh, someone else very close to me. I, I was using other objects, but they, if I, if I stroked the string too hard, the object would spring off of the string, and uh, you know, like hit people in the front row. And then I would go from having this prepared sound to having a normal string again. It was very confusing and complicated. And I don't have a very delicate touch. Um, I like to be able to sort of dig in. So I needed something that grasped the string, that clung onto the string better than that. And uh, and this wonderful friend showed me, he just, he just took a little split ring off of his baby Swiss army knife and said, try this. Mm -hmm. And I did, and it was the perfect sound. It stays, it grips really well on the string. So I use those of a lot of different sizes. I use little tiny ones that are five eighths of an inch to three eighths of an inch to quarter inch. Um, they all give different sounds and they're, and lots of them are made of different metals, um, different, uh, weights of notes. This is such a weird thing to be even sort of obsessing about. But anyway, that's, I use those a lot. Because um, depending on where you place it on the string, it makes a different sound. If you place it closer to the bridge, 
the, the rough pitch of the note is closer to the pitch of the string itself. And as you, as you move the split ring closer to the fingerboard, you get more of this sort of tonal array, okay. less of a specific pitch, and the sound that has both high and low frequencies at the same time. And I find that just kind of endlessly intriguing. I've never grown tired of all the variations that that can present. I do, with some compositions, place them very specifically in certain places because I, I would want them, I want to achieve a certain sort of tonality from that, that color. Okay. Um, so I use, I use those things a lot. Um, and then I use a variety of other objects from horsehair, individual horsehairs to um, bicycle inner tube, which is a, um, which is a, something that Fred Frith had showed me. And um, I use steel and other objects. I use um, some kitchen implements, nothing with motors, but kitchen implements that I hold to the strings or to the soundboard or to the bridge that resonate in a particular kind of way. I'm fond of um, uh, like egg slicers, the, sort of like a metal frame with little with very thin wires across it. Um, yeah, and sometimes I use a rubber ball on a toothpick. Okay. That I, that I sort of rub along the strings or I rub along the body of the guitar. Um, what I really like about that is that if if I take this rubber ball, and you, you have to use the older ones because the newer ones are made of recycled plastic and they don't they don't provide the same resistance that uh, the older ones do, which are made of rubber. And if you stick a toothpick in that rubber ball and 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 sort of graze it along the string, you excite a sound that goes both up and down at the same time, right? Because if you drag it, say, from the nut towards the saddle, okay. you're exciting sound that is both above and below the point of contact. It gets almost like a shepherd's tone, you know, because you're getting high, you're getting a sound that goes up and down at the same time. Oh, that's great. Makes sense? Now, I also, uh, on, on some of the videos, I've seen you playing different instruments, too. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, you do the banjo and the baritone guitar. Oh, let's be clear about the banjo. <laughs> I only play one song on the banjo. Okay. And it was because a friend, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, who owns a recording studio here, he sent me home with this banjo one day because I was feeling kind of uninspired, and he said, go home and write something on this banjo. Hmm. And... I was like, it's a banjo. He said, go home and write something on this banjo. So I did. So I had this one song that I, that I could play on the banjo. I'm really, truly not a banjo player. I did actually play um, some banjo on a wonderful jazz artist named Eric Deutsch. I, I played some banjo on his album, and I was totally afraid that somebody would hear that and then like want me to play banjo with their band or on their album because I really, I just don't know anything about it. Um, and... Uh, and so I'm, I'm sort of really, truly a one-trick pony on the banjo. My, um, my guitar of choice for since about 2006 has been, ha, has been almost exclusively baritone guitars. Okay. And um, that came about kind of by accident. Um, that I heard my friend Miroslav Tadic play uh, an arrangement of a Macedonian folk song on a baritone guitar that he had, and it was so beautiful. I just what the song is beautiful. And what instrument are you playing? Because it was like the sound I had been braving my whole entire life. Okay. Oh, that guitar he showed it to me. This huge baritone guitar. And um, took a couple of years before we arranged for the person who made that guitar for him to make one for me that's a little more my size. Okay. Because I'm not that big, and um, it was very difficult. It's still a little bit of a challenge to play a baritone guitar because they're just big and I'm yes. not really that so but it's the sound that I've loved and craved my whole life so okay I'm all about the baritone now <laughs> yes I notice when you do play you stand up most of the time whereas the classical style is to sit down is that because of the size of the baritone guitar <laughs> no, that would be such a great answer though um no I uh I was at a pinback concert one night, it was years and years ago, I was watching Pinback, and 
and I, and this, I had this one of those sort of like golden inspired flashes of moments, and I thought, oh, Zach's standing up, he's playing this sort of bass guitar hybrid thing, and I thought, this is what's missing is I need to be standing up because the whole like if you take a person who's who's a, who's five foot two inches tall like I am mm. and put me in a chair and put a guitar in my lap like it looks like nothing is happening it's so uninspiring that's and, very true and it's really kind of and like I've seen videos of myself when I was playing classical guitar and it's like it, it looks like nothing is happening here because. The only thing that's moving are my fingers forward of my knuckles, you know, on both right. hands. There's nothing really happening. It's not that cool. And then when I started playing standing up, and, you know, there was a little bit of a, a learning curve. I had to grow comfortable with it. But once I started playing standing up, I just felt so much better. Well, that's good. You know? Great. Yes. Now, you have a YouTube video channel that I've spent quite a bit of time on the last couple of days, especially. And uh, okay, yeah. the song you mentioned, the banjo song, is Ticking Time Bomb. And uh, the song that really stood out to me was A Thousand Million Petty Tyrants. Because uh, uh. the, the effects you have on there, you literally close your eyes and it has a very orchestral sound. It, there's just a lot happening uh, sonically. Yeah, I, I think if I remember right, there's maybe, um, we, we call them, for roach cooks, but they're these videos you do have on YouTube I liked the huge variety of sounds and again colors that you were able to project and oh, especially you. the song Angles and Exits uh, listening oh. to your version after hearing uh, Brian Beller's version of the same song oh. and uh, I was wondering what your your impression of his vision and what it's like seeing somebody else's interpretation of your song for the first time. Oh, that is such a great question. You know, I um, when Brian told me that he wanted to make a cover of that song, I thought, you want to do what with what? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was like, wait a minute, I don't really know how... Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I am first and foremost kind of just... Lord, that someone heard heard themselves in a song like that mm. and wanted to make their own version of it. And you know, at first it was it was kind of hard to divorce myself from my own version of it. And then the more that song developed in Brian's hands, and the more it came into being, what it is, 
I, I just could not, I could not be happier. I could not feel better about the fact that he did this and that um, he turned it into the, the sort of force that it is. Um, when I, as, as the song sort of moves towards its, that just sort of crushing ending, um, I feel the way I do sometimes when I'm listening to sort of like my favorite Nine Inch Nails songs and stuff okay. like that. Just this big, just relentless and aching presence. Um, I, I am, I'm, I'm just absolutely, I'm thrilled and I'm honored and I'm humbled um, at what Brian did with the song. Yes, well, I found too. It was uh, that album to me is an album of highlights, and that was one of the songs that really stayed with me for a long time uh, because it's just the haunting vocals he was able to add. Yeah, now, and you know, and, and to him, especially, he's not not known as a singer, and the fact that it it got so under his skin that he really wanted to sing it. That it, and he really, I mean, that that's what an accomplishment. You know, what a huge accomplishment for him. You uh, you have mentioned uh, already a few of the people you work with, and you have, on your resume, you have a number of collaborations and duos. And one that I'd like you to quickly tell the story of how you got involved in it is the $100 Guitar Project. Oh, oh gosh, that was so fun. Um, my friend Sean Persinger sent me an email, and he said, uh, this is something that's going on, and I think you'd be great on it. Um, and I don't know how many people are going to get to be on it, but you ought to send these guys an email um, because I think you'd be perfect on it. And he might have he might have talked to the guys who were putting that together. And so by the time I wrote to them, they were like, yeah, sure, we'd love you to be on it. The guitar is going to be in Colorado on these particular days. It would be great if you could record on it then. And... I was between a residency and a tour, and I literally had one day to travel about two and a half hours from where I live to where the guitar was. It was, uh, it was with a wonderful engineer named Bill Sharp, uh, who works a lot with Biota, and um, I went up to Bill's place and met the guitar. He told me a story about how this huge, devastating wildfire had just had just run through that region of Colorado, and you could see around his house, everything was charred and burned. But it was a beautiful day, and you could also see, like, green things poking up through this just landscape of, of, of burn, and his house had somehow been spared. And he told me the story about how the morning was beautiful and calm, and then he and then he felt some wind kind of pick up, and the next thing he knew, he was being evacuated, and the whole mm. region was engulfed in flames. Wow. And so, I started just messing around on that guitar and putting some things on the strings and seeing what it felt like. And uh, Bill left me alone for a while, and I composed this piece called "The Wind That Brought the Fire" because I all I could think about was this impressive story he was telling me about the right. soft wind that turned into a very strong wind that blew the fire right up the hillside where he lives. And, um, and so I, I recorded that piece that day. We, um, we, I don't know if we even edited much. We mixed it and I drove away by 10 o'clock that night. I, um, most of the people, uh, everybody on the project was, uh, was allowed a week to have the guitar in their possession before they packed it back up. But um, because of my schedule, I only had this one day. So mm. I took it back with me to Denver. I wrapped it up, packaged it up, and sent it on its way to the next person. Huh. That's great. That's uh, I, I love that story uh, of that whole project. It's uh, just fascinating. So Isn't it wonderful? It's such a great project. I'm so honored to be on it. I it really is. I'm just thrilled to be included in that roster of people. You know, we're just great. Now, is there any chance of you doing any kind of any shows in Canada? Oh, I can't wait to come back to Canada. I, the last time I was there, I was in Guelph. Okay. And um, and I, 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 you know what? It takes it takes just an invitation, and I will come. I can't wait to be back there again. Um, just invite me, and I'll come. 
I will definitely, I've got a few contacts, I'll definitely get on to that. And when, you, I think so. <laughs> and when you do come here, there's definitely going to be a Tim Hortons coffee with your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> great, 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 great. I can't wait. I can't wait. Okay, well, this has been fantastic. I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed talking to you. And, uh, and it's so nice to talk to you, too. Thanks for your great questions. And uh, you, you, I'm just I'm so thrilled that you're interested in chatting me up, especially for Let's Rock. You know, I'm, yes. uh, it's, uh, it's, it's ironic in the sweetest and nicest yeah. way. I'm Ken has just given me a note uh, to let you know that you are actually the first uh, first female that has been interviewed on Let's Rock. So, uh, I, and I hope that's the first of many. It's uh, it's not by uh, by choice. I've tried, but you're the first one that actually agreed to do it. There we go. <laughs> oh, that's so fantastic! Thank you very much. Uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, spending the time with us. And best of luck. Delight. Best of luck with your uh, you know your near future plans. Thanks, and the same to both of you. I hope we'll meet in the in in real time here by and by. I do hope so. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a beautiful night.